Hey everyone, Katie and Sergeant Steel here, and today I'm going to talk about the list that I took to the Warhammer Grand Narrative 2023 event. This one's pretty good. So I want to start out by saying that, yes, a few of the units that I bring are Forge World units, and they are only in resin. And that may not be something that every hobbyist looks forward to do. But I am a collector and hobbyist first and foremost, then a player. And with that, I do offer some alternatives in this list in which you can bring non-Forge World units. So just regular plastic kits that are made by Games Workshop and are available at warhammer.com that you can use in your list too. So don't be discouraged if you see these units in the list initially. This was just the core that I was bringing for fun. I switched them out later and show you some alternatives in plastic that you can bring to also have fun with and the variations of this list. Okay, so I want to start out with talking about the core of my list. So what it was, four out of six of my games, I took a 2,000 point list. That's what you see before you. And then I took two variants of this list to uh, the other two games that I played during the Grand Narrative event. So it starts out with, of course, my characters. I have a Cadian Castellan, which was Cadian Sergeant Steel here. I had two Cadian Command Squads and regimental attaches attached to um, Sergeant Steele and his command squad. And we also had a tech priest. So these were our characters and I took this in every single list. This was part of the core that I always used. The next part of the core was 60 infantry. So every 10 block is built exactly the same. Sergeant with a drum fed auto gun, melt -a gun, flamer, vox caster, las guns. Two of those were 20 man units, two were 10 man units. This was intentional. The reason being is I could put the characters as attached leaders to the 20 man blobs. The two 10 man blobs would hide behind buildings and other terrain and try to work their way onto objectives or stay in the backfield and stay hidden and be able to score points. So I wanted both resilient units and small units I could hide. So that's why I took two different size units. Then, I took two scout sentinels that were together in a unit with las cannons, hunter killer missile, and chainsaws. Then I took two independent heavy flamer scout sentinels, also with hunter killer missiles and chainsaws. The reason being is this allowed me to take three units. They're not too overpowered. It was narrative, so it was for fun. I wasn't pulling any shenanigans like taking three scout sentinels or three armored sentinels and resurrecting them with reinforcements. So instead I kept my units number small, but this was also enough for me to pressure the midfield early on if I wanted to, and also deal out enough daring recon buff to buff everything in my army if these survived. They served other functions, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. The other part of my core was the Rogaldorn with a presser cannon, multi-meltas and meltas, and a stubber. This thing was fantastic. So I always had the tech priest falling behind with this unit here. It would give it a four up inbound save, heal any damage it took from the previous round. And this thing basically drove around the table being an absolute terror to my opponents. Um, definitely, this is one of the strongest units we have along with the Scout Sentinels. I think these are really the strength of this list. Everything else was for fun. Um, next, we had two Basilisks, both with heavy bolters and Earthshaker cannons, of course, as typical loadout. Next though, was a lot of the fun. Now remember I took regimental attache, so I could buff the artillery, I could block out deep strikers, but with Master of the Fleet, I wanted to take advantage of that. And I also wanted to play with some of my cool models. I added in the Thunderbolt. It's got two last cannons, it's got auto cannons and Hellstrike missiles, and the Marauder Destroyer, one of my favorite models I've ever put together here. And it's got auto cannons, hell strike missiles, two heavy bolters, two assault cannons. And it also has a special unit ability where it can drop bombs. So really, really great unit um, and couldn't recommend it enough. So now that we've gone over all the units in the core list, one thing is just to remember the core abilities of all of these units. So let's start from the front and work our way back. So for the Cadian Shock Troopers, don't forget that they have sticky objectives. So if they move off an objective, you are considered to still being controlling that objective, even if you move away from it. They also can get a command point back if you use stratagems on them, 
um, provided they're still in the battlefield, so it doesn't work with reinforcements, so it does work with other stratagems. Um, so with the Vox Caster there, and if an officer's close by, you can get it back one five or four up, which is really nice. Next is the Cadian Castellan, so it gives you two things. If it's leading a unit, that unit gets sustained hits one, which is phenomenal for your LAS gun fire and sometimes on your other special uh, weapons here to get extra hits. Now, uh, every once in a while, you might get lucky with a Melta. The other thing that he does is allows you to fall back and still be able to shoot, which is phenomenal. So I usually was really aggressive with the 20-man squad that he was leading because they could get in a melee, fall back, and shoot, and everything worked out. The command squad is really important, too. They're one of the strongest units in the index for the guard currently. And what they can do is allow you to ignore any and all modifiers to all roles and tests except for your armor save. That's massive. And I, that's why I took two of them and put them both with the 20-man squads so they could never be negatively affected uh, by those modifiers. For the regimental attaches, they each have their own individual ability, 12 inch to deep strike, plus one to hit for uh, aircraft models. And then also the sustained hits one to one unit within 18 inches that it can see for artillery units. So you can get extra hits with artillery, you can get plus one to against one unit that it can see for aircraft and then 12 inch to deep strike. Tech priests can heal and then give a four up involved save to a vehicle. The scouts have daring recon, so they can give you reroll ones to hit for all units in your army against the unit that they recon, which has to also be within 18 inch range and visible to them. And then they can also give artillery the ability to ignore the penalties of indirect fire, which means your opponents still get their cover save, but you ignore the minus one for shooting or any other negatives that you might suffer as a for indirect fire. The Thunderbolt gets plus one to hit units that fly. Now, you might think, Okay, that's pretty niche, right? Okay, so shooting other aircraft. No. Plus one to hit units with the fly keyword. That is a lot of stuff in the game right now. So this one's a little bit of an outlier and basically naturally buffs itself if you're up against an army with fly, which I mean, let's face it, what army doesn't have fly? Maybe Votan, and that might be it. Every other army has key units that fly, and so this thing does come up more often than you expect it to. The Marauder Destroyer's ability is bomb. So if it flies over a model with a normal move and it always has to normal move, it can then roll a D6 on a three plus that does one mortal wound to that unit. Doesn't come up that often, not really that important quite honestly, but it's a fun little ability in case you just need to nick that one little wound off of there um, as you work through it. So those are all the abilities of the core units. Oh. The Rogodorn, my apologies. The king of the battlefield, I believe. Its special ability is Albative Plating. So once per game, you can reduce the damage of an attack to zero. Um, so this makes this unit even that much more resilient, regardless of its wounds and toughness that it already has. Then for the Basilisks, of course, um, their special ability is when they hit a unit with their Earthshaker, uh, cannons that unit then gets minus two to their movement and that can also be very key in controlling how your opponent moves across the table um, can be really great for slowing down terminators or slowing down charging units or just even stopping your opponent from getting on an objective to be quite honest so these can be really key in that board control kind of element so that is all their abilities and always keep that in mind when using each of these units because they all have a role to play so the synergy of this core works this way. The list can play one of two ways. It can either be aggressive and push forward early on, especially if I get turn one and I'm not facing a melee army, um, then I would typically push real hard to the middle of the table. Scout Sentinels pushing forward, planes obviously in reserves, tanks and troops could roll forward with some of them hanging back to hold my objectives and the Basilisks um, in the back just lobbing fire. But if I was up against a melee army, I may play this instead very conservative. And instead, maybe some Sentinels go forward to help screen and to help kind of um, blunt some of those turn one charges while everything else would just sit back and it wouldn't leave my deployment zone. So turn one, I might just sit in my deployment zone and just shoot out 
and try to wait it out a little bit. I usually didn't put anything in reserves other than the two aircraft. Then by the time turn two rolls around, I have the Thunderbolt and the Marauder coming in with the Master of the Fleet, hopefully near the middle of the table to pick out strong units for these two to get plus one ballistic skill against, or plus one to their hit rolls. So this way my aircraft are essentially hitting on threes, then with Darren Recon re-rolling ones. Same for the artillery, and the Rogaldorn uh, could also get re-roll ones from Daring Recon, or the infantry, whatever needed it. So this right here between the um, regimental attaches and the scout sentinels were the two synergy units, then everything else was having fun around these units. I typically spent most of my command points on reinforcements to bring back one of the scout units when they died. Uh, so this was so that I could not only keep using Daring Recon, but also keep putting pressure on my opponent. These units didn't kill a whole lot, and they never will. That wasn't the point. The point was to have a fast moving unit that could constantly put pressure onto my opponent and just tough enough to be annoying. So that was really great. Now, that's the core of how this list worked and how it operated. Um, and I gotta say, it was a ton of fun to play this list, which is why four out of six of my games, it was just this. But to mix it up a little bit, I took a couple variants that you all could also take. So one of those variants, actually in each of the variants, I take out the Marauder Destroyer. So we take that out. And the first one I did, or the first one I recommend is this one here. So I instead took out the Rogal, or the Marauder Destroyer, replaced it with a Rogal Dorn. This one's kind of my Dacadorn. So it's got the Gatling Cannon, it's got heavy stubbers, it's got heavy bolters and the Oppressor Cannon still and the Auto Cannon. Um, so this one here was meant to be anti-infantry the same way that the Marauder Destroyer was kind of meant to play. The Thunderbolt is more anti-tank, Marauder Destroyer more anti-elite, anti-infantry, and so this comes in to replace it. What this allowed me to do was have a unit that was just as tough as the Marauder Destroyer, if not tougher, and to be able to shoot turn one. So this is with, if I thought I needed the firepower and to clear out infantry, definitely turn one. Um, and I did this in my game against the Black Templars in order to try to thin them out in the middle of the table. And the other thing I add in for fun, because I love it and it's a unit that is dear to my heart, Kazerkin. This unit I brought had two multi guns, two plasma guns, plasma pistol, and power sword on a sergeant, and a, and a hot shot marksman rifle, and then four las guns and a box caster. This was so that it was a kind of a multi tool. It could hurt some elites, it could hurt some uh, maybe medium strength vehicles or land speeders and such. It could also hurt elite and infantry uh, as well with, the, with that weapon loadout. And with being able to give themselves orders while in reserves, because that's their unit ability. I was able to put them into reserves also, bring them on, and to be able to maneuver around the board and pressure objectives with them in addition to the Sentinels. I remember too, one of the other functions of kind of how this works is that the Basilisks don't just kill infantry and elites. They're also anti-movement. So in a list like this, what I would do is I would slow down, because this because if you're hit by a Basilisk Earthshaker cannon, you get minus two to your movement advance and charge. So that's huge against especially like charging and melee armies. And that allowed me to slow them down and then hit them harder with some of my infantry shots and some of my tank shots and just thin them out a little bit. And then Thunderbolt comes on turn two and does its thing, hopefully trying to clear a few vehicles and uh, do some damage to my opponent. But then, then there's another version of this list on top of that. So if you take out one of the scout sentinels and you take out the artillery pretty wild i know i know but bear with me here you add in two hades breaching drills and a hellhound so now what you have is a very very mobile list and what this is going to do is allow for me to deep strike Kazurkin, deep strike 20 man units with all the attached leaders on them. So I get deep strike a squad that was 29 or 30 models using a Hades breaching drill. Read the rules. Its abilities allow you to deploy a unit in reserves within nine inches of the drill, as long as it's also more than nine inches from your 
enemy units. The Hellhound does a fun thing where it eliminates cover. So I don't have the Basilisk anymore. I'm not reaching out and touching anybody. But as these units here, all the rest of the army moves forward and pounces on the enemy, this is there to pick out those troops in the midfield that are getting cover, remove that cover and make even my infantry shooting their LAS guns or this Dacadorn way more effective. So that's a really cool thing the Hellhound brings to the list. It's also fast moving. So now with the Hades Breaching Drills, two Orgledorns, three Scout Sentinels, and the, and the Thunderbolt, I'm able to move extremely fast across the table. And that was the point of this list. I want to be able to board control and the movement if necessary. So these were the three overall lists that I ran. Um, I really, you know, I'm not saying these are competitive lists. This was the Warhammer Grand Narrative event. And I believe that a fun game has a bit of edge to it. And you and your opponent are close and tight in your points and your score and your uh, playability. But I also believe you're not there to table your opponent. And I never did that. So these lists aren't here to take your opponent off the table. They are here to play and have fun and to play in different styles, right? I mean, look at that. We're talking Kazarkin coming in and Hellhounds moving fast and nobody expects a Breacher Drill, quite honestly, especially to bring with the rules as written now and it can bring in a blob of 30 Cadians. That's nobody, nobody expects that to be coming. And then if these make the charge, their melee weapon is basically a six attack Melta gun. That's their melee weapon, their Melta cutter. It's wild. Nobody wants to be caught near that. So that also adds some melee punch, which was really interesting to kind of have and just mix things up. But then if I didn't want to use these and I didn't want to use the Hellhound, I just add back in my other Scout Sentinel and I add back in my artillery. And quite honestly, I think two Orgle Dorns is sometimes a bit oppressive. So I take that out. I take out the fun of the Kazarkin and I put back in the Marauder Destroyer. And so each time I could just easily swap out units real quick, still have mostly the same core that I was running at 2000 points. All these lists are either 2000 points on the nose or somewhere around like 1,990. So really close to being topped out, always kept the same characters, always kept the same infantry, always kept this primary Rogador and the Thunderbolt every single time. And I just swapped out a few of the other kind of ancillary units. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that today. Um, it was a good, just kind of quick rundown of the lists that I took and the thoughts behind them and why I chose to take them to this particular event. Like I said, these aren't competitive lists, but these are fun lists. And I think they're in the middle of the road and perform decently well. Um, you'll see that I'll do a video later that is a recap of the games that I played and you'll be able to see how my lists perform but I'll also talk about a few mistakes that I made as a player, which contributed to my win-loss tie record for the event. So all of this just to say, I hope you had fun. I did. I love talking about these units and I loved taking and playing with this list. So if you happen to have these models or something close to it, maybe not a Thunderbolt, maybe instead of Valkyrie, and you want to run this list, I hope you get a chance to do that. And I hope you have fun doing it just the same way I did. So as always, have fun wargaming. Katie stands.